and we are back once again to talk about all things hormone and this time Nalette and I are here to talk you through fertility and obviously fertility is a massive subject I mean we're just saying there before we came on we really need to have another session where we talk about just the nutrients and how they impact fertility but today we'll mention a little bit about nutrients but mostly we're talking about the impact of hormones and all things uh, related but I think what Nalette and I are in agreement with is we absolutely love working in this area don't we Nalette? <laughs> yeah. It's really rewarding because we're working with something that's quite personal to each person. Mm -hmm. So it's really nice. Yeah. And, and I think as well, it's um, the lovely thing is, is when you do get that end result and someone sends you the photographs, I mean, it just lifts your heart. And you had one just last week that um, yeah, came did. through and um, that was just so, so exciting. And I think... Because very often we've worked with people for a long time. They get to that point, but it might be a short time. I mean, it, it's strange because sometimes if you find the reason and it's fairly straightforward, you, you know, you can make some impactful changes very quickly yeah. and get things moving in a matter of months. Um, you know, other times it, it takes what it takes, but it certainly is um, just so so um exciting and rewarding and just lovely and I just love babies anyway I, I'm one of these people that can't pass a baby so <laughs> and that's, everybody's journey is so different it you is. know it's it not is. it's not everybody's the same you know and when we do see those results it's so rewarding I mean when I got that picture last week of the little baby it made my evening it really did and that's the thing it's it's changing someone's life it really is such a rewarding part of the job. It is, it is. And I think, you know, the thing about fertility is that when you study fertility, um, then th there's so many aha moments and also so many wow moments that you're just like, oh my goodness, you know, if only I knew or if only this person knew or you think of a relative or a friend who's been through difficulties. Yeah. And you think, oh, my goodness, I could have helped them if I'd known, if I'd been able to share this information. So one of the things I always find interesting, we talked about environment in the last discussion, but we always get to talk about environment when it comes to functional yeah. medicine and particularly hormones. But if you think about the fact that one of the things that's interesting and people just don't talk about enough is why are we having so many difficulties now getting pregnant, staying right. pregnant why are there so many issues with miscarriage and so on? You know, what has gone on to, to set that up? Um, you know, we used to worry more about not getting pregnant decades ago, whereas now it's about getting pregnant that's become the problem. And um, again, you know, we, we mentioned in the last session about environmental factors and the fact that we are in in a different world we are more stressed we are um, exposed to many more toxins yeah. drug medication all of those xenoestrogens we mentioned last time you know toiletries and our cosmetics all of these things that impact our our hormone levels because we're absorbing all of these things that wouldn't have existed years ago yeah. um, and then another interesting thing is the pill so if we imagine that, that nowadays, very common for um, girls to be on the pill, you know, say from teenage, um, right. and yeah. then right the way until they choose to have a family. Yeah. And then they come off it and then they immediately go into trying for a baby. But meanwhile, as we said before, over the years, all those changes have happened with the pill. So the pill impacts our gut health, it impacts our microbiome, which is so important to our immune health, our nervous system, our hormones, everything. But it also depletes us of key nutrients, the very nutrients that we need, ironically, for fertility. So it would be much better if we had a period of preconceptual planning in an ideal world, coming off the pill, spending a few months or a year, it rebalancing things, making sure that our, our gut health's right, making sure that we've sorted out nutrient levels that might be depleted, maybe doing some blood tests to check levels, etc. But trying to really have a no stone left unturned approach to finding yeah. out what's going on and, and fixing things. And I can remember going to my, this is a long time ago now, before I had Harriet, 
um, going to my GP and I'd only been on the pill for years, for four years. Um, and I um, said, oh, I'm wanting to start a family. Um, should I do anything? Do I need to have a gap between coming off the pill and then starting? And he was a lovely guy. I mean, he was just the sweetest, sweetest man. He was lovely. But he said, no, people get pregnant on the pill. Doesn't seem to bother them. It, it just, you know, just crack on. And, yeah. um, but actually, he, he was entirely wrong in that suggestion because it does cause problems um, in order with our ability to get pregnant. But also, yeah. it's not just about getting pregnant. It's also staying pregnant. pregnant. Yeah, and and if we think about the relevance of our microbiome, our gut health, our vaginal microbiome as well, which is hugely relevant. I mean, that's a topic for another time, definitely on on fertility. We we'll keep thinking about different topics, but it's um, we need to be sorting out these things first before we then go into. And and I can remember using the term preconceptual planning. I mean, I was ahead of my time, I told you. People weren't even talking about that then, whereas now it's it's fabulous when we get couples who who come, you know, as a couple. It's not always the ladies coming yeah. wrong. We do get couples. You know, it's, we want to get couples. That's that's the yeah. ideal. Um, but it's lovely when we get the two coming to do preconceptual planning to say, look, is there anything I need to do to improve my health, to um to to to, to get pregnant and all of these things, but also to produce a healthy baby because it's not just about getting pregnant, it's about pregnant. health of the child. It's also about yeah. the health of the mum because at the end of this process, when you've gone through the factory process of making the baby, you then, when they come out the other end, you need to be able to look after them. You need to have energy, <laughs> and um, and when you have them, you really you really notice that, and um, and you need to be able to produce breast milk and, and other things if if you you know you're choosing to breastfeed, and that all takes energy, nutrient requirements, etc. So there's there's a lot of forward planning that needs to be done in the whole process. Yeah. So whatever your situation. Um, in an ideal world now, because of the context we live in and how things have changed and how food has changed and farming practice and toxin exposure and everything else, we really do need to be thinking about this, this preconceptual planning. We need to have this gap before we then go into having um, uh, a planned pregnancy. Yeah. Um, so that's that's exciting and that's what we're about. But one of the things that really annoys me um, in this in this world of fertility is that you know very often yes it's lovely when we get the preconceptual people but we also so more often than i'll get people who come with fertility challenges if we use that okay. term and they have been told very often that they have unexplained infertility and that's just a bit of a ridiculous term because um there's always a reason they haven't been basically it means they haven't been given one because they've had yeah. the basic tests done Everything seems to be normal. There is hormone checks, and they they looked at structural issues. You know, there's no blockages in the pipework, no. and everything seems to be hunky dory. So nobody knows it's a mystery as to why they can't get pregnant. And then we get a hold of them, look at their medical history, do some testing, and we can find a hundred reasons why they're having those difficulties. Um, yeah. and, and it and it's such a big topic. We would be here till midnight, and we wouldn't scratch the surface of that one. Um, but we, um, you know, our, our, our role is really to kick over those stones and find the reasons why. So we do offer an explanation, but not only we offer an explanation, we offer a plan. We offer a way through that to try and find out how we can can help you prepare for um, uh, fertility and support you in the most optimal way that we can do. Um, yeah. And I think as well, you know, when we do get to that stage in our life that we are ready to start a family, it is a case of most of the time women are coming off the pill and it's almost like we assume that it's just going to happen. But there's no information given to the effect that the pill has had over the last 10, 15, 20 years that a person's been on it. And then we then look at, so if we're not getting pregnant within a year, OK, what's going on? And then when we go to the doctor, it is just basic hormone screening. So you're not getting the information to find out. And then you're just getting that diagnosis of, you know, unexplained infertility. 
So then this is where a lot of couples do come to us is when they've just not had that support. They just haven't got the answer, you mm -hmm. know, and they want the answer. You, you know, they're having to go down the IVF route or um, trying to find a way of a reasoning behind it because there must be a reason why they can't um, fall pregnant naturally or it hasn't happened at that time. So mm -hmm. that's what we're there for. We're there to look at all of the um, information look mm -hmm. at all of the testing possible so that we can establish what are the factors that could be influencing the reason why they haven't been able to conceive so far. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And um, one of the other things that's interesting and often surprises people is that, you know, very often ladies will be put forward for IVF um, because they, um, they're having those difficulties, but actually they if they'd only looked a bit further if they'd only dug a bit deeper and checked a few things rebalanced a few things spent some time then they might not have needed the idea from the first place and actually we countless times work with ladies who are, are in that that situation yeah. and, and actually they come to us sometimes because they're preparing for IVF now obviously there are some situations where they, they have to have IVF and that's not going to change yeah. so our role then is to support them in exactly the same way to get the the best out of that process um, and to be as well as they possibly can be to prepare for that and there are very particular things that you need to address for that but sometimes um, more common than you think um, they do then get pregnant naturally um, yeah. and that's because we we found out the why and we've worked through that and so while they're coming to prepare for that actually they end up pregnant and it's it's always exciting um, when we have that, you know, when you and I both had that experience of meeting those kinds of people um, where, you know, they're, they're really taken, taken <laughs> by surprise um, when that does happen. And, you know, I'm always put in mind of a lady um, just a few years ago who um, had had three failed IVF attempts um, had also had a, a miss. One of those was as a miscarriage. And she came to us to prepare for what she thought the next IVF. But actually, yeah. when we delved deeper and did some testing, there were a few issues that she had, both in terms of nutrient deficiency, also in terms of um, issues on her Dutch report. And we worked through all of those. And actually, in her case, she was pregnant naturally within two months and then went on to have that baby. So that's, you know, some time ago now. Um, so but I mean, she was shocked. <laughs> in fact, I can remember her contacting us and saying, um, I think I'm pregnant. <laughs> what do you mean you think you're well? I've just done a test and it says I'm positive, but she just didn't believe it because yeah. um, you know, when you've had that experience, um, it, it does become a bit of a surprise. Um and um and in it's well shock and <laughs> not a surprise. But but yeah, you know, it's I mean that was a quick one, but you know, we can take a you know a good few months for things to change, but uh, or even up to a year or more sometimes that we have to work with people. But the point is we get there. And that's because we we've, we've taken the time and we've worked on the, the lifestyle, the diet, we've supplemented, we've checked things and stress. And it takes and it takes and worked on stress, absolutely. Yeah. That's a massive one. Um but you know, we we've taken that time to do all of those things. But I think another area of interest to us, obviously we're in nutrition and you think, well, why would we have these difficulties now again with um, fertility? And I know one of the subjects you love talking to clients about is what went wrong? You know, what happened in the 1980s that oh, really yeah. got us in a bit of a mess when it came to our, our concept of food and what we should yeah. be doing? And this is literally what I say to all women, the 80s ruined us. It really <laughs> did where we had low carb diets, low fat diets, which really are still around now. And I do get a lot. So when we go through the um, questionnaire that the client will fill out, it will be obviously, you know, your dietary um, patterns. Do you follow any diets? And so many do say low fat, low carb. And the problem is, is we generally associate fats into one umbrella you know so whether that's fried foods or you know avocados or anything like that so 
that's a really important food group when it comes to hormonal health. So we're looking at what we call healthy fats. So these are the extra virgin olive oil, oily fish, nuts and seeds, eggs, olives, those kind of things. And these are imperative when it comes to our hormonal balance because we actually manufacture a lot of our hormones from fats and protein. And if we don't have enough of the cholesterol within our body, we can't produce hormones. So we really struggle to produce the estrogen, the progesterone, particularly progesterone, which is known as our pregnancy hormone. So I do get a lot of clients that really struggle with that progesterone level, especially in relation to estrogen and that balance that we need to get. And ovulation can be a really big thing that sometimes often doesn't occur with a lot of women. So we really need to look at the whole picture. And, you know, diet is a really big factor. You know, blood sugar imbalance is a big one because we know that that's a stressor on the body. And any kind of stress on the body increases cortisol, whether that's an external stress or internal stress. When that's raised, we know that can impact on progesterone as well. Then we're going to get those irregular periods, spotting in between, possible pro um, problems with ovulation. So we know that the diet and lifestyle can play a big factor in our fertility and how likely we are to be able to conceive. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think that's a, a really, again, a really good historical example of how we've got it all wrong, how we've got it all a bit messed up and got confused when it comes to food. And this idea that if we remove fat from the diet, suddenly we're going to remove fat from around our middle as well. It doesn't work like that. In fact, the yeah. reverse is probably true. You yes. know, we need fat to, to balance the hormones and to, and to make sure that, um, you know, we are balancing our blood sugar and preventing problems with weight management. Um, but one of the other things around the 80s that's interesting is, yes, we had the low fat, low carb, but also sweetness. You know, yeah. all of a sudden everyone was adding sweetness into blooming everything. So you've got this yeah. diet drinks, diet foods. I mean, the word diet should just be banned on those foods because they're, they're just ridiculous. And um, when we're adding sweetness, we think about the microbiome. And imagine, you know, you've got a whole population of women now who maybe have been on the pill for years and that's damaging the microbiome. They're not eating enough vegetables to get that diversity in the gut. Maybe they've had years of antibiotic use because they've had difficulties with various um, infections, tonsillitis, UTIs, etc. cetera. Um, and then they're drinking diet drinks and things with sweeteners in, even flavored water they, with sweeteners yeah. in. Yeah, because they and, think it's a better alternative to sugar. That's right, that's right. And then, I mean, even the BMJ, few years ago reported on the impact of sweeteners on the microbiome so even within mainstream we're seeing much more now talked about gut health and the importance of the microbiome which of course we need for fertility but we also need for our nutrient absorption etc cetera, etc cetera. so it's you know you can begin to see the patterns you can begin to see historically when it all to go went wrong Added to that, the, the xenoestrogens went up and up and up because year on year, the, the amount of chemicals that we're exposed to apparently just literally goes up. You know, if we compare that to 50 years ago or 100 years ago, yeah. um, it, it's just crazy now. Um, so, again, it's that perfect storm. Um, and not just the ladies, but the guys as well, yeah. because the sperm count is now much reduced and that's because of all of these environmental factors. And, you know, we're, we're seeing now that when you, you go for when the testing, the, 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 um, the reference ranges now are, are completely different because the averages are different because there's been this shift um, historically. So the sperm count now is much less than it used to be. So the norm now has changed or what we consider the norm. But again, we're not asking enough, well, why? What's the context here? What's the drivers? What do we need to be addressing? Um, but these are the things that we address. So really a lot of our job actually is education. It's about saying, well, look, this has happened, but these are the things that can impact that. And therefore let's look at how we can change a few of these things. And it doesn't take much change. It just takes a few strategic, really impactful um, changes to get things to where we want them to be. Um, and then when we look at nutrients, I mean, 
the example of when we talk about sperm and egg health actually one of the absolute critical nutrients is zinc and you know zinc is important for every single parameter of, of sperm health the size of the sperm the motility the speed the number of the sperm uh, all of these things so you know you really need zinc is the bottom line if you're a guy <laughs> But, and I say that we need it for progesterone. And I often yeah. say to my clients, do you eat oysters? Because that obviously is one of the highest sources of zinc. Yeah. Most people don't. But it's just about how can we get that zinc in? You know, what way? You know, when it comes to things like vitamin D. And this is why we do further testing, such as a metabolic testing, so that we look at thyroid health, vitamin D status, B12 status, that kind of thing. Because... Vitamin D impacts on obviously egg quality as well, omega-3, coenzyme Q10 for sperm health. It's just all these bits. And this is why I like working with couples as well, because often when we think of fertility, we just think of the woman and that's it. Yes, that's you know, right. that's the female side of it. But actually, we really need to be focusing on a whole. And especially if you're co-inhabiting as well you know, you're eating the same kind of food. So, you know, you have the same kind of routine. So that plays a really big role mm -hmm. as well. You know, how is the partner eating? How are you eating? Is that affecting what you're doing? What kind of chemicals are you exposed to? So it is about the whole thing rather than it just being one person and then just looking at a few little um, parameters of the fertility. Yeah, absolutely. And again, with a lot of these, it's not even just are you eating the food it's back to are you absorbing it and that's when we're back to looking at other issues with gut health ongoing has this person had IBS reflux indigestion all of these sorts of things is there maybe a SIBO going on you know what exactly is there or are there medications they're currently taking that are depleting those key nutrients and there are many and drug medications that we have to think about and I must say that's a big thing I think with male health is gut mm. you know and i not it's not really a spoken about subject when it comes no, to, no. Um, you know, they don't really talk about their bowel movements, you know, when yes. they're having fights. So, yes. you know, and that plays a big role in how we're digesting the food, how we're assimilating those nutrients. Mm -hmm. And if we're not factoring that in, how are we getting those nutrients? Because I think people don't associate, you know, we just produce eggs, we just produce sperm, but actually we need those nutrients to factor into producing right. that so if we're not taking that into consideration we're eliminating that whole element that's the most important that's right that's right and of course 100 years ago our bodies would have been eating by default yes. all of the very foods that we should yeah. be eating in order yeah. to produce these things and so and we wouldn't have to think about it it would just happen anyway yeah and convenience foods are lacking in most of those nutrients mm. and the problem or it's got other ingredients that can make it more difficult to absorb or we've got lots of nutrients that alter the microbiome which can then obviously again mm. impact on how we assimilate those nutrients so there's lots of right. factors to take into account but what we don't want to be doing is go no you can't eat any of that but let's see what do we need to address what do we really need to rein in a little bit what do we need to really support yeah yeah absolutely and i think you know other things in terms of environmental factors again back to the guys is thinking well are they a smoker yeah uh, because they're thinking about zinc if we're smoking then we're going to deplete our zinc yeah. and the other thing is that if we have low stomach acid levels then if we're eating our food too quickly if we're not chewing our food properly this can impact us all in terms of nutrient absorption but zinc is a real casualty of that if yeah. we're fast eating and also if then we're ironically making the situation worse by taking various antacids by taking whether it's rennies and gaviscons through to proton pump inhibitors like imeprazole um, which is given out like sweets these days but the problem is that we we end up things just backfire and you know you take someone who's already got low stomach acid and then they end up with problems like indigestion reflux etc and then they take something which is going to make that even worse yeah and because then you know, we're losing these key nutrients yeah it's because they're led to believe that they've got too much stomach acid that's right so right. what they're doing is they're trying to put out the fire which isn't there and that's right yeah, exactly <laughs> that's right 
so so yes there's a lot of things that we that we have to think about but um i mean one of the nutrients you mentioned that was vitamin d and of course you know we, we call it a vitamin but it's actually a hormone yes. and, it's, and it's a hugely impactful hormone that we need for many many things but egg and sperm health you know it, it's it's absolutely pivotal for fertility um and so you know again we are going to go through um, another session we're going to have at some point in the future and have some fun with this and talk about individual nutrients and the relevance to um to fertility but um the next thing that we want to talk about today is, is looking at the hormones and obviously you know when people come to us they, they will send an email of whatever test that they've had done so we can have a look at that and check that before they come and then we can fill in the gaps and a really important gap that we feel in is actually thyroid health mm -hmm. and Again, our thyroid is this, you know, our thyroid gland is this wonderful little butterfly gland right here. And it's like it flies around the body doing all these magical things. It's phenomenal. We need it for so many aspects of our metabolic health. And the knock-on effect with our reproductive hormones at all stages of life is huge. And the relevance of facility is absolutely make or break. And whether we're talking getting pregnant, whether we're talking staying pregnant, we need really good levels of thyroid hormone. And one of the difficulties here is testing because currently standard testing, uh, depending on where you live, might just be TSH. It might be TSH and T4, um, but that's it pretty much. And that doesn't give us enough information. First of all, even if you do have those done, the reference range is not as it should be. So what we're told is normal, actually, it isn't necessarily and certainly isn't helpful for um, fertility because we need to have an optimal TSH and T4 in order to, to get pregnant. So that's the first thing. But the next thing is that we don't have enough analytes being checked. So we really, really need to address the antibodies. So our thyroid antibodies, because we need to know, is this an autoimmune situation? Are there antibodies here being elevated? Because... Again, if there are elevated antibodies, the problem with this is that you can have antibodies elevated for years before you then develop changes with the actual thyroid hormone. And if you don't know that, you're going to be left scratching your head and in the dark yeah. and, and wondering why you're having symptoms. And so the symptoms are going to be things like fatigue, big time. And one of the things that thyroid ladies often say with underactive thyroid is that it's a bit like walking through mud or yeah. walking through treacle because the fatigue is just a grinding fatigue and the brain fog, you know, everything slows down. And it's, it's you know, horrible when you're trapped in that and you're wondering why. Apart from fatigue, it's low mood, anxiety, and then we've got constipation, dry skin, hair loss, these are the common ones. Um, and actually, I mentioned Harriet before in the last talk, we mentioned PCOS. She also has underactive thyroid since she was 17. But within my family, underactive thyroid specifically is right through the family, entire family tree from top to bottom and sideways. So it's, um, in fact, if you're a woman in my family and you haven't got it, <laughs> that's unusual. But it has made me very, very interested in this area but also very cross about the way it's poorly understood and poorly managed. Um, and in this area of fertility, it's it's a huge hot potato, which really needs addressing. And not just for the getting pregnant, but also prevention of miscarriage as well. And so many ladies with recurrent miscarriage, and again, they don't know that they've got suboptimal or subclinical hypothyroidism. They don't know that they've got elevated antibodies because nobody's ever checked them. And so again, they're scratching their heads and wondering why. But meanwhile, these poor souls have still got their constipation. They've still got their hair loss and their fatigue and everything else. And they can't lose weight. This is another one. Um, and no matter what they do, um, and, and they feel absolutely trapped, absolutely trapped. And then the classic is that then because if you tell someone, oh, well, you're tired and your mood's not what it was, you've got depression. Yeah. Then you're given an antidepressant. Meanwhile, you gain a stone or two stone, 
And still nobody's addressed these things, because if they do, the problem is the numbers haven't changed. The numbers on the screen haven't changed because it hasn't been long enough. But the antibodies are still changed. Maybe it depends yeah. on the situation, but that could be a reason why. Um, I mean, there are lots of reasons why there is issues with the thyroid. 90% of them are autoimmune, but there's other things. It might be low in key nutrients that we need to support thyroid health. And if that's the case, we need to find out what they are and address them. Problem solved. But it's all about the finding out the why. And that's yeah. really where we come in. And that's hugely impactful. Yeah, and it's and it's looking at all avenues. You know, when it comes to fertility, it's not just a a small amount of you know mediocre testing it's really about looking at the whole picture and the effects of different things you know we obviously a lot of them are looking at progesterone but we look at progesterone in a much better um detail in regards to the balance with estrogen because looking at it on, on its own isn't really going to be helping um, to establish what could be causing any infertility issues. You know, looking at what stress is doing to the body, is that impacting on how your hormonal balance is affecting you? So it really is making sure that all parameters are looked at, all the factors and mm -hmm. figure out, because everybody's different. It's not all going to be the same answer for every single person. You know, we could have somebody that has more of a thyroid issue, somebody with more of a hormonal imbalance, somebody that it's a driver is stress, you know, and they mm -hmm. don't realise. So it really is about looking at everything. It is. It is. Absolutely. And I think that, you know, a lot of people think, well, even if there was a thyroid problem, why on earth would a nutritionist work with that? You know, surely you just take you take thyroid hormone then, don't you? You take some thyroid mm -hmm. and that's it. End of, end of story. That's only part of the story because yeah. you've then got, if it is autoimmune especially, you, you've got all of the other things to address, but also to, to maintain good thyroid health. We need to think about all of the nutrients that are required to be able to, to sort that out, to be able to, you know, adequate levels of protein to manufacture the thyroid hormone. They need good levels of iron, you need selenium, you need zinc yeah. and so on. But if these are missing for whatever reason, then just taking thyroxine isn't going to cut it. And also the T4 has to convert to the T3, the active form of the hormone. But there are pieces of that puzzle which need to be there to make that yeah. happen. Yeah. Yeah. Nutrition, managing stress, etc., etc. So we need to make sure that, that we've kicked over all of those stones to make sure that you are properly, because it's not enough to say, oh, well, you're on Therox and now that's it. Problem solved, that's go away. No. no, 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 no. We need to look at the, the big picture and we need to address all of those things. And also very often we need to address gut health, immune health. And immune yeah. system factors are huge, especially when we're talking about autoimmune issues. Yeah. Um, so we really need to look at those ongoing immune issues in the background um, in order to be able to manage the whole picture. Yeah. And um, that, we know that any kind of immune dysregulation can impact on inflammation within the body. We know an increased inflammation can be a driver for hormonal imbalances, thyroid issues, because we know cortisol, although it's a great hormone because it gets us up in the morning, we need it. But what we don't want, we don't want elevated amounts. And when we have elevation of cortisol over long periods of time, that can drive inflammation. Do we have insulin resistance? You know, have we got um, issues with estrogen, progesterone, all those kind of things that could be influenced by inflammation? That's right. Absolutely. Absolutely. And there are loads of hidden factors that, again, we're not even going to get into because we just literally <laughs> could be here all, all, all day. Um, so, you know, again, you know, we, we'd start a hormone screen with including thyroid, that's the first thing, you know, we would always, always address. That's just, it's simply a no brainer to not check that because it's so relevant to a lot of these cases. And it can make the difference between getting pregnant, not getting pregnant, miscarry, not miscarry. And, and the other thing is, you know, imagine people going through IVF and they've spent a fortune in in having this, these tests done and, and having this, this service in the hope of having the, the, this a, a baby. But if they spend all that money and they've got elevated antibodies with the thyroid and they've got that suboptimal thyroid function and they're much greater risk of miscarriage so it, it's heartbreaking to think they could be spending all that money and all that never mind the money it's the emotional investment when it's going to end in disaster for many of those people because they don't know they just simply don't know and so nobody's addressed the thyroid piece of the puzzle 
and that's a scandal actually there's no other word for it um, no, I've, I've had, yeah I've had a lot of women that have had tests they've been out of the normal range but the doctors have said it's got no influence on your mm -hmm. fertility mm -hmm. which we isn't right and that's yeah. not correct and we know the impact it can have and it's yeah. really devastating for lots of women and couples when they're not given the answers or they've been told something and it it still isn't giving them the answer that they need and that's what we're there for we're there to support them and go okay we're going to look at the whole picture and that's mm. what we're going to break it down and look at what areas we need to address how mm. can we address how can we incorporate it into your life? Because there's no point in us saying, do this, do that. And they go, well, you know, my life's too busy and, you know, I can't factor this in. It's about working with each individual and making sure that it factors into their life. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And and I do think that, you know, in the job that we, we do, we again, we are, we're just so privileged to have this up to date knowledge. And as soon as research comes out, as soon as there's another paper, as soon as there's something new, we're immediate. Oh, did you know that? We're on it immediately. Because you want the best for your clients. You want to help them with the most up-to-date information that you possibly can. And um, and I think there's too much of, you know, within mainstream, it can take, I guess, about 17 years for any new research to get into the hands of the NHS. And, yeah. and often you'll hear, or oh, new research has shown, however, dot, 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 yeah, more research is needed. This is the buzzword. More research is needed, and that can take years. Meanwhile, you're in a situation where you want answers now, and this yeah. is where we come in because we don't play those games. We do take seriously all of the research, and and we we're trying to look for the most optimal way of of helping you based on what's currently available for us. So that's um again and the exciting part of what we do. But within the Dutch test, again, we we use that optimally because we're looking at the balance of those hormones we're looking at how you detoxify and metabolize those hormones um so again we do the test on specific days because we want to know post ovulation how your progesterone is performing because that needs to be really robust obviously for pregnancy but also for prevention of miscarriage as well um that's a really really key um hormone so that's a another thing that we um are able to do properly within that testing isn't it in a letter and that's something that um is is very interesting and educational to people when we show them that and it, we explain how things should be looking yeah and often because most women just think of estrogen as being their sort of that main sex hormone and when it comes to pregnancy we know that progesterone is the pregnancy hormone so that's often one that we can really talk to the um, client about when we're looking at sort of fertility are the levels low because obviously what we need is we need good amounts of progesterone so that the uterine lining is there ready for implantation and that's what progesterone is there for if fertilization doesn't occur then obviously then uh, progesterone levels drop off and then obviously we then have um, the shedding of the um, lining and that's where we then have our menstrual um, bleed but we want to make sure that those levels are optimal, ready for implantation. And then we can continue with that to prevent um, miscarriage because obviously it is the pregnancy hormone and it's the most important one that can help prevent um, a miscarriage. So we really need to make sure those levels are optimal so that we can then get a good um, conception and then into pregnancy. Absolutely, absolutely. So. Also, the next topic is um, within the test is the stress hormones. Yeah. And this is a really key one. And we all know in fertility, we've all heard of those stories where somebody hasn't been able to get pregnant and then they, they've gone off on a holiday. They've finally taken a break from work or whatever's going on in their lives and bingo, they get pregnant. And I remember um, oh, over 30 years ago now, a lady who... Um, wasn't able to get pregnant 10 years she'd been waiting she didn't go for any fertility um support at all she hadn't gone to a clinic but she she just thought well if it's not meant to be it's not meant to be so she'd kind of given up thinking about it and this is 10 years on they went on a cruise professional couple really stressed went on a cruise and bingo out of the blue she got pregnant so you know stress is hugely impactful but the thing about stress is that often we, we just think oh yeah well we're stressed yeah yeah, yeah. there's nothing yeah. I can do about that or, um, oh, I'm not stressed. 
I'm not stressed. <laughs> so that's the other thing where we're in denial about it, or we, we think we're okay. We think we're coping. We and just I think what's, yeah, yeah, I think we, we're all good at that. We're all good at that, especially women. Yeah. And um, and I think we just get so you blooming used to it. That's the thing. It just becomes the, the new norm. But again, if we um, when we're looking at the Dutch test and we're looking at those stress hormones in some detail, um, we begin to get further ideas of, oh, maybe stress is a bit more of a problem than we might have thought. Um, and that's where it can become really interesting. And this is another really impactful area of the work that we do, isn't it? Yeah. And the thing is, it's, you know, fertility can be a really stressful situation anyway. Plus, if we then add IVF into the mix, that can make it more difficult because obviously stress is, is you know, what both the, um, the man and the woman are running on. So we've then got to really address how that's impacting on hormones, you know. So it really is about looking at the whole picture and making sure that we can't, look, we can't get rid of stress, you know, we can't get rid of work. We can't no. get rid of worries and the media and everything else. But what we can do is make our body more resilient to it. Mm -hmm. And that's the most important thing. If we're not eating um, three meals a day or we're skipping food or we're running on sugar or caffeine, we know that's going to be impacting even more on your stress response. So you're going to be finding it more difficult to respond to the stresses that you're dealing with every day. Are we looking at blood sugar imbalances? Are we looking at caffeine addiction? You know, are we running on um, sort mm. of the being high? Are we looking at addiction to sugar in regards to are we having to continue our day with a sugar pick me up? You know, those kind of things. And are we dealing with stress really well? Are we taking any time out for ourselves? Are mm. we engaging in any relaxation? any time in nature, gentle exercise, even over-exercising can be a big stressor on some people's bodies. Mm -hmm. So it really is about looking at what factors could be driving that stress. It doesn't have to just be, a you know, work. It could be completely different. Mm -hmm. and, and I think as well, there are lots of chemical and physiological stressors. Part of them are those things we said, the xenoestrogens and all of these things, but maybe the drug medication that you're taking. And, you know, and ironically, as you say, over exercise you know you think you're doing doing good because you're exercising maybe you're doing too much and that can be a real problem for hormone balancing so it, it's trying to get the balance right in all things and uh, and that's really a big part of where we come in because we're trying to to find out the why yeah. and yeah. if someone is eating the foods that really are not helping them so they're not eating you know the nutritious foods they're not cooking they don't have why they're not cooking are they just not having energy are they just so exhausted yeah. when they come in at night bless them that they just cannot stand and we all know what that feels like for you just, yeah. it's a thought to come in and then and have and cook dinner that's where things like slow cook is another and batch cooking and things come in because that really is a, is a lifesaver for all of us including myself and the lesser but it's you know we, we all live with these stresses in life and we all are trying to make the best out of a bad job with a lot of these things but it's I think when we understand the significance of stress and how it's so easy when you're exhausted and stressed and just depleted to then grab a quick fix to grab a ready meal to grab a food that is not even food anymore it's highly processed it's devoid of nutrients it's there's a lot of chemicals and things added to it things we can't even pronounce and shouldn't be eating and certainly our great great grandparents weren't eating this food and that's where, and it's so easy, and we can all do that, we can all be guilty of that, but then it's then impacting on nutrient status, because then we're not eating the nutrients that we need in order to be able to do these things that our body should just be able to do naturally, because that's how we're designed. Yeah, and we need these key nutrients for egg quality, you know, and that's a big factor, you know, the quality of the egg. We could be making enough estrogen progesterone to obviously, you know, get that right hormonal balance. But if the egg quality isn't there, if we haven't got those key nutrients, then we're going to be really struggling. So it really and even obviously sperm health as well. I mean, that's I think that's a big factor as well. You know, looking at the male side of it, you know, how are they? What's their diet like? What's their lifestyle like? How is stress impacting on them? Are Have they got good, sufficient vitamin D levels? What their omega-3 status? Are they eating any zinc-rich foods? You know, all those bits that 
won't necessarily be you know considered when we're looking at fertility but should be yeah absolutely and I think that <clears throat> as well you know again we do get to be fair we do get more ladies coming and asking for support with fertility than we do get guys some guys are, are great and they, they will come along others not others are a bit embarrassed about talking about these things as well but so a lot of ladies will ask well is it worth me coming if he doesn't come then if he's not doing his piece but of course it is because but it, it the, the other thing is, is as part of that education piece we can can give um the mom perspective on all the tools that they need and we can be very sneaky we really can i mean yeah we can be very sneaky with our husbands i know i am i know you are yeah. and, you know, we can sneak in those pumpkin seeds to his porridge and think why are you eating them for but you don't have to time it to your sperm count you just have to add them in <laughs> so you know we we are mindful of that we're mindful and sympathetic of those difficulties and those challenges but you know as long as we can help you uh, uh, as the mum coming along and preparing um and you know making some changes and very often you know both will eat the same foods mm. so if you're making changes then by default they're also making changes so you know and even if you get them on a decent multi and you give them some zinc and some omega-3 and vitamin d and some core things we can do an awful lot. And, and if you're aware that they're super stressed or they're over exercising or whatever you think, oh, actually, I think they might be doing very gently and slowly and empathetically, you can just introduce these ideas yeah, and, and make those changes. So there are ways of doing things. Um, yeah. Behind the scenes, shall we say. Yeah. Um, and I, always, and I always say to clients that it's never about making these changes like that. Yeah. Because that's just more stress. So it what is it is, stress. About, it's it is about stress. it in little stages. <laughs> so even if it just means tomorrow changing the breakfast and trying to incorporate a breakfast or That's a right. nourishment to start the day, then Absolutely. in a few weeks time, then work on something else and then work on something else. Because what we don't want is to go, oh my goodness, how am I going to do all of this? Failed on the one day or don't attempt something and then that's it. You think you've, you know, failed, but it's not, yeah. it's about, taking it in stages and incorporating it into your life to really support yeah. or you know whether it's fertility or hormonal yeah. balance that's right that's right and again it's not forcing yourself to do things that don't give you joy you know food should yeah. give you joy should be pleasurable we shouldn't force ourselves to eat a piece of salmon if we absolutely hate it um we, we should find the things we do like and that we are going to get joy from um because that's important as well um and uh yeah i mean we're mindful of these things we're just the same as you are we have our preferences and um likes and dislikes and th the key thing is is knowing well these are the foods that i can choose from that will give me this nutrient okay well i don't like that one so i'm gonna eat that one and, yeah. and overall as long as we're hitting hitting the, the right scores with everything and getting a good balance that's all that really matters um now when it comes to things like egg, egg health and, and sperm health we also need antioxidants and we're back to that word again and of course in our wonderful dutch test we do have an oxidative stress marker which gives us clues around you know a number of different things but certainly the number of antioxidants that we eat in the diet will will help with that and you know we we think of antioxidants and we think of the goji berry or something like that and people think well is that does that mean eating more fruit or whatever but actually we're thinking about specific nutrients um, thinking about things like vitamin A and D and E, these are really important um, antioxidants, selenium, vitamin D, all of these things are really, really important. CoQ10, as the letter mentioned before, for the sperm health, egg health. These are all examples of antioxidants, which most people don't know about. But they're all, among others, really relevant for um, fertility. So we do need to address those and a very quick way of um, making sure that we have some of these key antioxidants and increasing them is by eating well. Because if we eat well and we eat nutrient dense, then by default, we're going we're gonna to hit a lot of these targets anyway, yeah. without worrying about it, without stressing about it. And um, when we eat organic, so again, a lot of people... Um, and you might read online, oh, it's really helpful to go organic when you're trying uh, for a family. Why would that be? Well, when we eat organic food, then we're having more nutrients, number one, because organic food will have a higher amount of the vitamins and minerals, etc., than non-organic. But equally, it will have more 
antioxidants. And the biggest studies to date on this came from Newcastle University, where they found without a huge meta-analysis, found out with a shadow, without a shadow of a doubt, we do get more antioxidants in our organic produce. Yeah. Now, there is a cost implication with that. So we do have to think, right, what's realistic for us? Which are the key ones? How could I really make an impactful change here? You know, and, and we look at things, there's a thing called the dirty dozen and the clean 15, where the dirty dozen are the most, the highest in pesticide and the clean 15 are the least. So we don't have to worry about the clean 15, but we do have to consider things like apples and berries, et cetera, that are on this dirty dozen. So we can make some significant strategic moves with our diet to up those antioxidants and up the nutrient status. Um, and that's going to make a big difference to, to diet. And another big thing as well is often what we use for cooking. So when we look at the oils that we use, you know, now it's it's um, corn oils, rapeseed oils, vegetable oils, which aren't made of vegetables. <laughs> and we're, we're devoid of all of those wonderful omega-3. They're really high omega-6, which can be pro-inflammatory within the body. And they're driver for a lot of metabolic um, disease. We should be really focusing on things like olive oil, avocado oil, extra virgin olive oil, coconut oil, those kind of things, beef tallow, those kind of things, butter, because they have more higher um, anti-inflammatory components, omega-3, and they're amazing healthy fats for the body, which obviously we need for hormonal balance. So even just if that was just a simple change by changing what you're using for cooking can be a big um, have a big influence on hormonal balance. Absolutely, absolutely. And and it's this is where, as well, what we do becomes an absolute minefield. And I'm sure, you know, like me, when you were studying, you'd be looking at things and thinking, oh my goodness, just when I thought I'd cracked it, then they throw something else in that I've got to change. <laughs> yeah, <definitely>. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I didn't know that. Why didn't somebody, or non-state pans is another one. You know, it's just, I it literally goes on and on and on. And, and again, but it's having... I think I think with all of these things, you know, we all live in the real world. And I think you've got to come at this with a sense of humor. Sense of humor is important in everything. And do you know what a sense of humor you really need for good hormones? <laughs> so, um, you know, I think with all of this, it's about being kind to ourselves and, and doing things in, in a way that's compassionate and just exactly. not rushing. But it's yes. also why, you know, you were saying about taking time. And it's interesting because it reminds me of certain emails that we get that will say, well, if I come to you, how long will it take? You know? yes. And, you know, it depends. I have no idea who you are. I don't know anything about your medical history. Um, I really don't know. But it, it's also knowing how much needs to change, but also what ability do you have to make those changes you know what stage are you at in life and also yeah. how supported are you in the home are your yeah. family with you on this or are you on your own with these changes um you know what what do you have available in the workplace have you got a nice canteen at work where there's a big salad bar and there's lots of hot foods getting cooked at lunchtime instead of just a sandwich and a machine in a packet of crisps yeah. you know it's like what's going on in your life that will really help you to do these things smoothly and with ease to make this transition and there are so many variables there are so many things that you know we can't always control for but we just have to do our best and I think yeah, awesome. But giving ourselves time, I yeah, think that's, that's the key thing. Because what we don't want is for people to stress about things. We want people to understand, well, these are the things we need to work on. These are things that are going to really make impactful change for you. Um, and we're going to hold your hand with that. We're going to be with you. Uh, we're going to laugh with you, cry with you, do whatever's needed. But we're going to get you from this point to that point so that hopefully we'll get everything in balance and then we can give you the green light to go ahead and try again yeah. um you know when the time is right for you and uh it it's just um you know fabulous to have all of these things that we can do uh you know thinking the 
right at the bottom of the test. You know, we mentioned antioxidants. Another one that pops into mind there is the glutathione. You know, yeah. that it's, it's a lovely thing. So um, we've got our sex hormones, our stress hormones. We've got the ha- the androgens, the male sex hormones. Um, we've got some organic acids, looking at some of the nutrients there. We've got um, melatonin, which is needed for multiple reasons in, in pregnancy. Um, and we have got glutathione, which is the master antioxidant in the body, and that's assessed in this test. So it's involved in liver detoxification. Um, but again, crucially relevant to, to, to fertility and for reasons that, again, we would go well over time if we were to get into that. But what I will say, which is an interesting one with glutathione, is that we it, it's often very depleted um, because of dietary reasons, but also if we're taking lots of paracetamol, let's say, which is just widely used now, if you're having period pain, headaches, et cetera, et cetera, joint pain, and you're popping paracetamol left, right, and center, then that will deplete glutathione as well. Um, so again, it's back to these environmental factors and understanding how these lifestyle things affect us. But then if we are popping paracetamol for headaches, why are we having headaches all the time? Are you low in magnesium? Are you low in B2? Are you low in omega-3? Or have you got food sensitivities? Why are you having headaches all the time? Why are you having period pains all the time? We did that in yesterday's, but it's, we have to find the why, because if we don't find that why, it leads to another problem. And then we're finding out that why, which takes us back to that why, and see what goes on. And that's really um, how we work, because we're constantly looking at every possible variable to find out what on earth is going on in that story. And it takes a bit of unraveling, you know, it's like peeling the layers off an onion. That analogy is often used to describe what we do, that we have to, you know, go dig dig deeper and deeper and deeper until we find um, what the answers are and, and then get things back where they should be, back in balance. Definitely, and it is, it's just, it's, it's not a one size fits all. It's working individually with each person. And it is like you said, there's laughter, there's tears, and sometimes there's a lot of tears. But we really are, and that's what I love the most about the job we do is that we're giving these people the support they need. And often we're their only ear that's listening. You know, they often don't have another outlet, they don't feel they can talk to anybody else. So we do, you know, they're um, laying out a lot of their their feelings and, you know, their emotions. So and that's what we're there for, to really help support them in every element. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think that it's um, it, it's trying to explain that we are, yes, we're about diet, we're about lifestyle. Yes, we use supplements when, when relevant. But what we aren't into is green pharmacy because that's not good that is no good (laughs) you know it's not about saying oh well i've got low amh so i just need to take this supplement and that will fix it no we need to look at the why we haven't addressed the why and your why is not the same as mine it's not the same as naletta's so it's it's trying to find out why otherwise you're wasting your time and money and if we just use supplements then we would be guilty of green pharmacy of exactly what the rest of the mainstream medical world was about which is about the the pill for an ill and we're not about that yes it's, it's, but it's understanding and, and and sympathizing with the context whether that's your home environment whether that's your individual stresses at home your level of support at home and in the workplace and that whole history that makes you you or me me and so um you know that's really fascinating for us it's it's a source of a uh, never-ending fascination actually and we're always learning i mean every day in this game is a school day there's new research coming out all the time um i'm away to a conference this weekend i mean there's just always something um and it's it's hugely hugely impactful to to make any kind of change and the thing is that even if you think oh my gosh that's an awful lot to think about um the point is just start just wherever you're at just start because when you start, you begin to feel a bit better. When you feel a bit better, then you think, do you know what? I'm ready to do a little bit more now. Let's go and do that. And then we do that. And then you feel a bit better again and you build your confidence. And then you think, right, let's do the next thing. And before yeah. you know it, you've actually done an awful lot. 
but I think that we we are able to help you navigate that and to say, do you know what? I think that's maybe we won't do all those things just now because it's just too much. Let's just start with these things. How about that? Yes. OK, I feel confident I can do that. Um, and, you know, I, I would prefer it. I mean, gosh, if somebody threw a load of stuff at me, <laughs> I'd be like running away and eating a packet of crisps, I think. You know, it's <laughs> like um, it, it just becomes overwhelming. And when we get overwhelmed, we panic, we go into fight or flight, we go immediately into our default, we reach for a piece of chocolate. You know, yeah. nothing wrong with chocolate, by the way, as long as it's dark chocolate. And Naletta and I are lovers of chocolate and chocolate. Oh, yes. Is, if it's the right kind, it's going to give us antioxidants. So we definitely want to have plenty of quality chocolate. And um, so there you go. I think that's probably a nice topic to end on, actually, because <laughs> that's another long session there. But um, but yes, just to say that we are human, we are normal and we are your friend in this. And we understand what you're going through and how hugely stressful the whole thing can be, how hugely emotional um, the whole thing can be. I've had family members who've gone through lots of difficulties with fertility and IVF and so on and, and, and recurrent miscarriage. So it's um it it it's just yeah, so so difficult, so so difficult. But um anyway, if you are um, interested to know more, you can drop us an email anytime. And you can also arrange discovery calls with both myself and the letter to discuss any hormonal challenge you've got or any worry you've got. Um, and then we can answer your questions, talk through the kinds of things we would look at. Um, and that would be really nice. It'd be lovely to meet you as well. Um, so I hope you found today helpful um, and that it's taken um, some of the fear or worries out of um, maybe working with us. Um, and hopefully we will see you again at our next um, hormone session that we will record. But thank you for um joining us and thank you to Naletta um, 